Good morning and welcome to you, sir. How are you doing? Thanks. Good morning. Well, as you see, I'm getting a tan. I've lost weight and I'm just walking with my candidates. <laughs> Certainly. Now, uh, Mr. Griffith, you know, uh, like we, we, we saw quite a bit of activity recently. Uh, first of all, there was a comment made by uh, the political leader of the UNC, of course, um, the, the party you guys are, uh, are collaborating with, partner with, partnering with for this uh, local government elections, and especially talking about that, that quote, that light them up quote, that has attracted quite a lot of cr negative criticism in the space. So I would just like to get your opinions on that. Well, I, I will give my opinion, not as a politician, but more importantly, as someone who is trained in law enforcement and the use of force policy. Because what is unfortunate, we have media houses actually using criminologists and persons with absolutely no knowledge, education, experience, qualification in that type of, of um, system. So as it pertains to what Kamala Prasad Bissessa said, everyone could take sentences from persons and turn it to one extreme or the other if it benefits them or affects them. And in this case, that is what has happened. She had, her statement, what people try to turn it into believing that it means that she wants to use excessive force. That if somebody is shot, you're going to go for them and just finish your clip on them. That is not what she said. People interpret that. It reminds me so much of when I said, if somebody is a murderer, if somebody kills your family, if somebody rapes your loved one, I see them as a cockroach. And then liars will turn that and say, Gary Griffith said black people are cockroaches. Mm -hmm. But they will say that Keith Rowley said that they are pests, that certain people are pests and hyenas. So it shows people will take a sentence and deliberately lie and keep saying the same thing. So the perception now is that Kamala is trying to say that if somebody is shot, your job is to go and finish the clip on them. She never said that. When she spoke about emptying the clip, it can very well be along the line that what we are seeing now in this country, in home invasion, several people break into your home and they have assault weapons, illegal weapons, automatic weapons that can fire 5.56 rounds, 35 of these rounds in three seconds, you cannot fire one isolated shot at a time to suppress them. You have to use as many rounds as possible because you have a small arm that was issued to you by me on most occasions. And with that, it makes it difficult, if not impossible, for you to suppress individuals coming up to your home, coming to, into your bedroom, and you're in a firefight and you're firing one, one round. The reason I could say that is as a commissioner of police, as a trained law enforcement expert, that is the reason why I increased the ammunition from 25 rounds to 50 rounds. That is why persons are getting three magazines instead of two. Because if you're involved in hostile conflict and armed conflict in a situation with persons with assault rifles that are firing automatic rounds, you have to fire as many rounds as possible. What you see in the movies, it is not it is not um, makeup. A lot of these persons, these yeah. shows, these television shows and movies, it's based on law enforcement experts explaining to them how it should be done, whether it is Chicago PD, Blue Bloods, whatever you watch. And then you will notice, if it is that there's heavy fire, you will notice, what is, why, is the, why do they keep firing so many rounds? Because if you don't and you just fire one round at a time, they're going to keep getting closer to you, getting closer to you. And with that type of hostile fire, you're going to go down. So the empty the clip is something that is mandatory based on the situation. It is not based on every single case. If you, you fire one round and the person is neutralized, you should, not be, you should not continue firing because that is now manslaughter. So there's a case-by-case -case scenario. People have deliberately turned it into one specific perception and then label her as being um, erratic and um, trying to say that people should abuse their authority and break the law. Um, why do you think that there's such a reluctance from our government, uh, from, from uh, the, the PNM, I should say, as to, to allow people to have guns for their own protection, especially I, I, in, a, in a state of crime that we are facing right now? I am starting to believe there's a there's a there's, the, the, that criminal on the rule has some type of link, and it means, and this is not any person I'm calling in the government, but it seems that there's some link that the criminal on the rule will have with persons in authority who can make decisions. And I'll tell you why. It's not just firearms. My wife Nicole Diagraphy for eight years, something as simple as pepper spray to give women a fighting chance. They have refused to do so. Mm -hmm. So it, it's starting to give the impression this can't be incompetence, this can't be ignorance, this has to be some deliberate agenda that you want to protect criminals. Because why would you not want to give a law-abiding citizen the right to have a firearm to protect themselves from being killed? What is wrong with it? And the reason I could say that is that 
Keith Rowley and Fitzgerald Hines and company, they do not have a problem with firearms because between the two of them and the previous commissioner of police, between the three of them, over, they made over 70 requests for firearms for their rich and famous friends. So why is it that it's okay for rich and famous friends closely associated with people in high places to get a firearm? But if I was issuing firearms to the simple police officer, past or present, soldier, sailor, prison officer whose life is at risk, the small farmer, the small businessman, why is it that they should not get one? And the point, the fact, the fact is by them lying to say that we were issuing firearms willy-nilly. I issued 2,000 firearms to civilians out of 1.4 million. That's something like about 0.15% of the population. And then they lied to say, well, no, he was just giving away firearms. The government lied. Keith Rowley lied to the country. And this is Gary Griffith being quoted so that you wouldn't have any concern about it. Because he kept saying that we were giving out firearms to everyone. 2,000 out of 1.4 million. There were over 50,000 applicants for 10 years that the, the previous commissioners didn't have the basic courtesy to even acknowledge their correspondence. Because these commissioners are old school. Their job is to work with a cane and wear garbaline and sit down behind a desk. The commissioners after me had the same perception. And that is what Kamala Prasad is stating. We have, a, we have to amend it because if you have a, an old time dinosaur commissioner who feels, well, civilians should wear firearms, that is not your business. That is not your right. So when Keith Rowley said that, my, and Heinz have been saying that my style was different, it's because I did my job. Because I am being punished because of my because of me doing the right thing. Because there's nothing, there's not a list to say that you must give out 50 firearms a year to persons. There's nothing saying you, you could give out you, you could give out 50,000. The point is, is that if there's a law, and the law presently states that if you have some body and mind, you do the background check, and, you, and you're eligible to get one, then you do it. So why is it that it shouldn't be done? So I think the government is based on incompetence, ignorance, or that is based on some deliberate agenda by certain persons in high places who seem to have some degree of sympathy for criminal elements. Because it goes back to even when Kamala continues to speak about, about giving people a fighting chance, you hear Keith Rowley speaking about what they're trying to do is if a child goes and a boy goes in the yard, you can shoot the child. Or if somebody looks to steal a mango, you can, um, you can shoot the person. That is a lie. That is not stand your ground. That is not what she's speaking about. She's speaking about the problems we have now where a mother could have a home invasion. The husband is not there. He has a firearm. She grabs the firearm, shoots at the, at the criminal in her home. I know she could very well be charged for manslaughter because the firearm did not belong to her. And then the firearm will now be seized by the police and several years they will now be without a firearm, no fault of their own, but because they did their job. And now there could be reprisal. All of these things must change. And that, and that is the focus. And, you know, we see that there's been quite a lot of focus from your platform as well as the UNC um, in terms of being able to, to deal with this crime situation. And um, is it, would you say that this is, this is the biggest issue right now in Trinidad as you guys are campaigning for the local government elections? Yeah, um, Keith Rowley and the PNM have tried their best to divert and say, well, um, the local government election is not about national security or crime. It's about box drains and potholes and drains. Ah, I have walked the length and breadth of the East-West Corridor. Um, I've walked in the hills in Paramin, in, up in Scorpion, in, in Carnage in um, Sim Simeon Road in Pity Valley, um, into Bagatelle, Beatum, Sealots, Duncan Street, Nelson Street, um, went into Lavantil Road, uh, Aruka, Trin City, Arima, and every single place that I have gone, that the main thing that they've heard is two things. A total, well, first they said they've never seen the political leader of the PNM in any of these places in their lives, and people have been there for decades, one. Two, they've never seen the, the um, Councillor in that area, the PNM councillor since 2019, when they when they turned up begging them to vote for them, and the third, their biggest concern is crime. So as much as the the PNM will want to divert and say, well, crime is not an issue, it is an issue. And what we have been saying is that if we have access to control the cooperation, it will give me the opportunity to utilize the same tools, policies, programs that I utilize as Commissioner of Police and Minister of National Security that the country would have seen the highest reduction in in serious crime when I was Minister of National Security, the highest reduction in violent crime when I was Commissioner of Police. And I'm able to utilize some of these policies to be able to put some degree of control and stability in those corporations to reduce crime and to make those citizens safer. And what are some of those measures? I mean, I know that, for instance, in, in the municipal corporations, I mean, you have the police, um, the, the, your own police force in the cities and so on. Um, is that part of the plan that you are putting forward 
for bringing some relief to the crime situation faced by many in communities throughout Trinidad? Yeah, good question. And, and, a, and a simple example to show that municipal police can work and can be effective with an immediate response. The NTA decided to have a, a walkabout at Sangwa Kwesi about two days ago. And we wrote to the Mova police station, we wrote, wrote to those in Barataria. The police came out in numbers to make sure that everything was okay. And the chairman of the Sangwa Lamente Regional Corporation, Anthony Roberts, in a very arrogant manner, contacts the municipal police and sends them down to, to Sangwa Kwesi to give an order to us that we should remove ourselves immediately. Now, apart from the fact of him being totally ignorant to understand, you're not supposed to give instructions to police as a, as a politician. Two, there was no law being broken because I, when the municipal police came, I said, please say, what is the law? And they went, well, hmm. And this time, the, the, the TTPS officers are there being disrespected because it's what we are right here. We are watching you and you're not even taking us on. This has been done. The letters have been written. It has been approved and we are here on the compound. But the point being is that it shows how effective municipal police can be. It's just that they try, the, the politicians try to use it in the wrong way, in the same way that the, the, this PNM government have been trying to use police officers to investigate and go on witch hunting expeditions and fishing expeditions in the hope that they could find something about legal firearms. And after two years, after all the lies about a well-known criminal industry, not one person has even been questioned as it pertains to white-collar crime, bribery, or blackmail as it pertains to firearms. So they lied and they misuse police resources. So but going back to the municipal police, it shows how effective they can be if they're utilized in the right manner. And that is what we intend to do. We intend to utilize the municipal police, similar to what I did when I was commissioner of police, putting a lockdown, a gridlock, GPS tracking on vehicles, monitoring where they are, making sure that they have body cameras, pepper spray, having a high visibility, working with the, the, the other business arms, utilizing their cameras to have an operational command center, getting public trust and confidence, getting information fed to me, first of what is known as predictive policing. So there's a lot that could be done. And that is what caused in my last year, it was 342 murders for the year. It was the lowest number of murders in about 17 years. After I left, what, just a few months later, it moved from 342 murders in my last year to over 600. So it shows that what was there, was it was working. What happened in the PNM because of pettiness and vindictiveness, they shut down, dismantled, and removed every single thing, whether it were units, individuals, technology, equipment, policies, and that is what has caused the problem. So what we're saying is that you, you control the cooperation, you have access to the resources, the tools, the equipment, some of the personnel to be able to make that cooperation safer. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, we also seen coming out in the news yesterday, um, uh, your wife, Ms. Nicole Dyer Griffith, um, speaking about uh, allegations that her phone was tapped, and it seems as though some of the government apparatus has been used to spy on citizens. What light can you yeah, share um, on that? Yeah, sure. This, this is not the first, and it won't be the last until we deal with it in a, in a proper manner. In 2009, this is what the PNM government they were doing. We actually, I got the sheet and I have the list of the persons whose phones were being intercepted based on instructions by the PNM to the person who was in charge of the intelligence unit at the time. Um, they were in, in, um, tapping the phones of Keith Rowley himself because he was an enemy of the PNM, even though he was in the PNM. Um, Gary Griffith, Kamala Prasad, the Cesar, Winston Bukharan, Alan Roberts, 53 persons' phones were being tapped. We, when we got into government, we did the Interception of Communication Act. And with that act, it, it ensured that um, the only persons who can intercept would be the commissioner of police, the director of the SSC, or the chief of defense staff. Unfortunately, guess who appoints all three? The politicians again. So how, why, how it was drafted, we made a flow. So if it is a, a, a politician, handpicks somebody as commissioner of police, which is what this government has, has done now virtually, and then you, or, or the chief of defense staff, they can easily now send a letter to the SSC state that, this person under intelligence reveals that this person is a possible terrorist. We need to have their phone tapped. And that is abuse of authority. That is abuse of, of the, and it affects the constitutional rights of citizens. It affects their rights to privacy. You cannot use technology to interfere and to intercept and to invade the privacy of citizens because they may not be politically affiliated to you. That is abuse of the technology and the equipment that we have. This equipment and technology is there for criminal elements. So you can't just use the word intelligence and use that as an excuse to justify breaching and, infect and affecting the privacy of citizens. 
So my wife's phone being intercepted is because I actually saw the document. The document was there. I saw who signed it. I saw it who was addressed to. I saw the date. It was all submitted to the court. And the court still said, well, we're still dismissing it. And I mean, basically, this has a big fa factor as it pertains to whistleblowers. Because if it is that the court is saying that we need hard evidence before we go forward to take action on the state based on abuse of, of technology, and now you're asking for more for full evidence, you are not going to virtually affect the, the whistleblower because the more evidence you give, the greater possibility it is that the whistleblower can now be targeted as being the person who leaked the information and they did this based on the fact that they understood that there was abuse of resources and technology by the state to target political opponents, which is not what it is used for, should be used for. Mm. And then turning back our attention back to the local government election, and um, we'll, I know that there's been quite a lot of seats that were marginal in the last elections that were held. Um, what's, is, is there, are you getting more positive feedback in those marginal seats? Um, at, at this point in time, as you're going through on the ground campaigning? Yeah. Well, interesting. And there was no much. What we are going in from Diego Martin, Port of Spain, Sao Love, until Piaco, Tunapuna, Arima, Point Fortin, there was no marginal. All of those seats in the 31 that we have been going for, the PNM won two to one. So the perception that this is home and drive for the NTA is not. Two to one, we're talking about 1,400 to 300, 800 to 300. The PNM won comprehensively. They won all 10 in Diego Martin. They won all in Port of Spain. They, all the four seats we are going for, they, the PNM won easily. The two in Arima, the PNM won the five in point fourteen. So they were all won easily by the PNM. However, that was in a two-horse um, race with the PNM and the UNC. Mm. In 2010, when you had the COP impact of that third constituency joining forces and voting alongside with their UNC brothers, half of those seats would have been won by the COP. Diego Martin, for example, seven of the 10 would have been won with, um, for, for the COP and the UNC combined. Um, three or four extra seats in Port of Spain. Arima went over to the People's Partnership. Same thing with Tunapuna and Piaco. Uh, and same thing with San Fernando. So at this time, what we are seeing is uh, that degree of flip over. It's going to be a lot of votes for us to turn back because uh, uh, you went in 1,400 to 400. In a local government election, a thousand votes difference, eight hundred votes difference. It's a lot because that's because the numbers are pretty small. It's not like general election where it is, it is like eight thousand votes to seven thousand. So because of that, it, it's a lot of flip over. But a lot of that has to do with the third constituency of persons who may previously vote for the PNM because they did not want to vote for the UNC. But now that they have a, a third choice, well, sorry, a, a third party that they, they have decided to vote and join. So if we have the same flip over of 2010, we may very well win several seats, if not corporations. San Fernando is, is another that I'm actually working with the UNC candidate because that is only by UNC. But I'm working with the UNC candidate. I actually spoke in the, in the UNC meeting in San Fernando last night, asking all of those third party voters, whether you ONR, NAR, COP, NTA, to vote for the UNC candidate in those in San Fernando. And if that happens, then worst case scenario, it could be 8-6. Best case, case scenario, even as we get a repeat of 2010, it can be very well be 12 too. Mm -hmm. And then just looking at the broader picture of things, um, how do you think the, this local government elections would affect the, the overall political atmosphere in Trinidad and Tobago? Well, excellent question. This is the mother of all local government elections. And the reason I said that is firstly, it is the first time in our history that a government refused to call an election, did not want to call an election, and have been forced to do so against their will. That is why it was so significant for them to bring in international observers, because we expect that if you didn't want something to happen, you may very well cheat to, to have the result in your favor because you weren't prepared and you didn't want it to happen. That is why it was so important. By the government being reluctant to bring international observers, it has triggered uh, a concern even greater, and, and, and rightly so. And if and when the PNM is defeated, this is going to be the beginning of the end for Keith Rowley, because after the annihilation he got in Tobago, and then to be defeated in the local government election, there's no coming back from there, because it means that if we, we are successful in local government, it means that the coalition, the accommodation, the alliance, whatever you want to call it, would have worked 
it will it will bring the parties closer together it will unite the parties even more there's going to be greater mutual respect cooperation communication better understanding and that synergy is going to blossom into possibly what we saw not in 2010 but more so i will say 1986 with the nar and that is what happened in the local government election in 1983 when the unr went for certain areas the ulf went for certain areas it worked and that that built the platform and the bridge towards the general election. So that is how important this local government election is. And that's why we expect and hope that the voter turnout will not be the usual 35%, but I think it will be more into 40 to the 45s. Mm -hmm. Well, we're certainly looking forward to seeing if we will get a bigger voter turnout, because we know the local government, like you said, it traditionally has such a low, a such a low turnout. Um, and then, I mean, are you... Are you getting the feeling that more people are interested in the politics? Because I know that for some people, they are saying that, you know what, they they really are tired of, of all the drama and it, they, they're just not paying attention to it. They're, they're ignoring it. But, but what, your, what, what are the reactions that you are getting? Well, just, just by the political meetings that you're seeing with the PNM, the UNC, the NTA, the headlines and so forth, you've never seen this before. In a local government election. Local government election is usually mean, oh, let's just get it over and done with. That is not what you're picking up here. You're seeing a lot of emotion, a lot of passion, a lot of bitterness, a lot of humor. And I think the, the country is hyped up for this election, and especially with younger persons. I mean, <clears throat> as I said, the places that I have gone that no political leader has ever gone, when it is that I've gone there, you're actually hearing persons very, very emotional and excited to want to go out there to send a loud and clear message to certain persons on August the 14th. So I think this is going to be a local government election with a difference. Mm -hmm. And then what is the future looking like for the NTE with the UNC? Are you guys looking to continue? And as well, how is Mr. Jakuano uh, working along with you guys? Well, again, as I said, the, I am very strategic in what I do. Some people were, were, were concerned by us working with the UNC, but I explained, I said, listen, I'm very strategic. It is not coincidental that 31 of 45 US presidents had military service. <clears throat> Even where I trained in the military in the United Kingdom, <clears throat> it is the same academy that Queen Elizabeth's sons uh, and others would have gone to. They prepare you for leadership. They prepare you to understand strategy, tactics, <clears throat> because politics by and large is an art of war without firing a weapon, well, hopefully. <clears throat> and by doing it that way, I looked at the maths, I looked at the data, and when you're in politics, you're politics to win. You don't get in politics to, to be an activist. You're in politics to try to get in government to serve people. The only way I can get in, I can get to serve people, 89% of the country wants me to remain in a position of authority to serve them with their most fundamental right, which was that of safety and security. The only way I can get back in there to do that for you is to be in government. The only way that, it, that any third party can get in government is to work with another party to be in government. Every single time that happens, the PNM is defeated. 1986, 1995, 2010 general election, and 2010 local government. Every single time the third party works on its own, they get lots of votes and no seats. 1981 with the UNR 19, um, with 91,000 votes. 1991 with the NAR with 127,000 votes. 2007 with the COP with 147,000 votes. I have no intention to have my and our 150,000 third party supporters go down the road like that where we say, oh, yes, we're going alone and we're fighting alone and we win alone and we lose alone, and then you have nothing. No. If I understand the importance and the value of us trying to get in a position to serve the country, we have formed that strategic alliance, and coalitions have worked around the world. There have been over 80 countries that had coalition governments, which is almost half of the countries in the world. Many still have over 13 united in, um, in Europe, uh, over a dozen in Asia, Africa, and the Americas. Then you have regular governments that have worked and have not worked. This is a government that stands on its own and it is the worst government ever. So we are seeing the importance of the coalition. We, it, we expect it to work as it has all the time in, in Trinidad and Tobago's history. As it pertains to Jack Warner, the concerns that people have, they will have their reasons for that concern. I can't, I'm not here to debate about it. What I can state is that Jack Warner holds no position of authority in any executive or any position in the UNTA or the UNC. So what is the concern that I should have at this time? Because he holds no position. If the UNC has 250,000 supporters and we have, say, 150,000, out of 400,000, we're supposed to be doing what? Background checks and certificates of character for each person who supports us. Jack Warner is simply uh, somebody who supports the NT and the UNC alliance. Even as he has the charisma that is going to attract many grassroots voters to vote for us, 
Well, then that's the PLM's problem to be concerned, not mine, because Jack Warner does not have any position of authority in any executive constituency, parliament, or representation in either the NT or the UNC. And what I can state is I have worked with him in Lupino, in Borneo, in San Fernando. And all that I am getting is almost 100% of the persons who, who met him, they were, I mean, they were, all that you were, you were hearing was singing praises for his performance, his work, his diligence, how he was able to serve them, be accessible, assist them, listen to them. And I think instead of persons remembering Jack Warner for what it is that he that he is dealing with internationally, the politicians should understand what a politician should be doing. And that is what Jack Warner has done when he was a politician. And I have learned from that, which is why you will see me doing what, what the, the political leader of the PNL can never do. Walk the ground, get on the ground, work with your candidates and hear the needs and concerns of those persons on the ground that you want to vote for, that you want them to vote for you. And then finally, as we have just one more week left, just about one more week left of campaigning before the local government elections, uh, what can we expect from, from, from well, your campaign? Actually, yeah, nine days, eight hours and 23 seconds, but who's counting? God, I can't. I can't wait for it to finish. Um, but it has been a long haul. This has been the longest campaign ever because, you know, usually uh, the election bell will ring when the, it comes out of the, or the prime minister's back pocket, and that will usually be five weeks or so. But this has gone on for over two months. So it has taken a toll on many people. Uh, but again, you've seen, you've seen the excitement, the energy. Um, persons want to be part of this. Uh, and, and, it, and it is not just about trying to vote out the PNM. Even the PNM... Um, there, there's been a deafening silence. Uh, I don't know whether they have decided to concede. When you hear a prime minister stating that the results don't matter, that is a sign of you have already given up. Um, it has been a long, a long one. Um, but I, it, what has been valued to me is actually being on the ground and going to places where no political leader has ever gone and actually seeing the poverty, the needs, the concern, the disregard, the disrespect that so many citizens in Trinidad have, have endured by voting for a political party blindly, and just because you say, well, uh, PNM till I die. Being like that does not help you in your way. If it is your, your a sporting fanatic like myself, I am Manchester United till I die. And for the last 10 years, I have suffered. But that is different. Supporting a football team is different. There's no need to support a political party blindly. If it is that they are incompetent, that they are not serving you, then, they, then you need to send that loud and clear message. And I expect come August 14th, that would be sent. All right, we're definitely looking forward to it. Thank you so much to Mr. Griffith for joining us and for giving us some perspectives on what's been going on within the political space in Trinidad as well as Trinidad as a whole. So thank you. Thank you so much. Okay.